Please you were to take a Bible and if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be reading from verse 20 down to verse 28. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Were you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's been a challenging week, hasn't it? It's been a roller coaster of emotions for me this week. Um, I actually slept really well last night, which was a blessing, because I can't say that for most nights this week. How are you all doing? It's kind of a scary question to ask and to really sit and expect an answer in this moment, isn't it? I think the honest answer is many of us are not doing all that well. We're struggling. I've seen some beautiful things this week as people have showed up for each other and cared for each other. Many of you have been those people showing up for your neighbors. And many of you have been served by your neighbors. What a privilege that is to give and receive love and care to those around us. This passage, which I picked some weeks ago, I think is still very relevant for us today. It's a passage about true greatness, a passage in which Jesus calls his disciples to serve. And we've witnessed that. We've been a part of it this week. Let's pray and ask God to guide us as we reflect on this, these passages. Father, we thank you for your love and care and the privilege we have had this week in the midst of chaos, uncertainty, suffering. The privilege we have had of seeing grace revealed. So many people with willing hands and hearts who have, who have helped and encouraged and comforted. And sometimes in one moment, we've been the person giving the comfort, and in another moment, we've been the person needing the comfort. And we thank you for the giving and the receiving, and that we can belong to a community in which your love flows freely. Guide us now as we reflect in these next few minutes on this interaction that Jesus had with two of his disciples and their mother so long ago. Thank you. Amen.
mothers love their sons. And this mother of James and John comes to Jesus and kneels down in front of him with a request. Lord, when it comes time and all the disciples get to sit on thrones, because Jesus had promised them, all 12 of you are going to sit on thrones. You're going to, you're going to judge Israel. So she's thinking of that. And she realizes that her two boys, James and John, have been especially close to Jesus. There's kind of, of the 12 disciples, there are three that are especially close. Peter, James, and John. They're kind of the inner circle. And not long before this, Jesus has had some hard words to say to Peter. He even called him Satan. So perhaps the mother of James and John in this moment sees an opportunity. Her boys have already been promised thrones. Peter's on the outs. This is the right moment to come and to say, Lord, my boys, please, would, would you do me this favor? Let them be the ones to sit the closest to you. And Jesus responds with a question to the boys, not their mother, but he looks at the boys who are there and says, can you drink the cup that I am about to drink? What is that cup? What is the cup that Jesus is about to drink? Throughout the scriptures and in the Old Testament, this cup is a cup of suffering. And more than that, it's a cup of judgment. It's a cup, we sometimes say, of God's wrath. Now that can make us quite uncomfortable to think about the wrath of God, the anger of God. Many people around us right now who are suffering are feeling like Maybe God's wrath has been poured out on them. And they're wondering, what have I done? I had someone tell me this week as they're interacting with people out and about, a lot of people are really mad at God right now. It's hard to know what to say to them. People find themselves mad at God because they think God is mad at them. When Jesus talks about and anger always go together. If you are a parent and somebody is causing harm to your children, you get angry. Love, if it is truly love, it's going to get angry when bad things happen, when wrong is done to the children. So when you and I go through our lives and cause harm to other people around us, we deserve the wrath of a loving father. When you and I go through life and we cause harm to ourselves and destroy the, the beautiful creation that God made us to be, his love, if it is love, is angry about that. How do we live in the presence of this kind of love and anger. Jesus is directing us to the answer with, with what he says to these disciples. Can you drink the cup that I am about to drink? What is he about to do? Jesus is about to go to the cross. Verse 28, he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is giving his life to save, to ransom, to pay the price, to give freedom to all people. And that means he will drink the cup of judgment and anger. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was in such agony on the cross? Even before he got to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating blood. 
He's in agony. If, if you look at the history of the Christian church, there have been many people who have died for their faith, who went to their uh, deaths singing. Are those people better than Jesus, that they were able to hold on to faith and joy somehow in the midst of their suffering and he wasn't? No. What you've got to understand, what's happening on the cross, is that the greatest human of all time, the one who was more filled with the joy of God than any other person ever, was experiencing the wrath of God being poured out upon him without measure because he was taking all of it upon himself. Why would he drink such a cup? The perfect man, the one who always served, the one who always blessed, the one who never desired to be first. He always had that attitude of service. Why would he take the cup? He didn't deserve the cup, but he took it for a reason, and that reason was you and me. He drank the cup, so it's done. If you grasp this, if you receive the gift of Jesus and what he has done for you, you live with the freedom because you know that God is not angry with you. Because all of the anger that you deserve from God has been drained down by Jesus when he drank the cup. He asked the disciples, can you drink the cup? There's no way anybody else could have drunk that cup. Jesus did that for you. What does that do for you in your life? It means that you get to live in a whole new way. You get to live without fear. You get to live without guilt for your past. You get to live in a new relationship with your heavenly father. When you are consumed by guilt, you don't want a relationship with God. But when you know that he loves you and Jesus is your savior, you get to live in a joyful relationship with God. But then, because you have received his grace. Jesus says, you will become a servant of all. Your life will be a life characterized by so much peace and joy and goodness. And you will drink. Do you notice here? Jesus says, Okay, you will drink the cup. This is not the same cup that Jesus is drinking from. This is not the big cup, the cup of all the wrath of God. But he says, you will drink the cup. You too will live a life not drinking down the wrath of God against sin, but you will, you will live a life that will experience suffering. You will face hardship in this world. It's not going to be easy. James went on to become the first Christian martyr. John, out of those 12 disciples, probably lived the longest, but went through great persecution and suffering over the course of his life. None of us is immune from suffering and hardship. But the sufferings we experience are not because God is angry with us. Jesus has taken that. He emptied that cup. The sufferings we experience are the sufferings that come to anyone who would seek to live in this world doing good and loving others. Because if you live a life of service and love, you put your heart on the line every day. And you will get hurt over and over and over again. How do you keep going in the midst of suffering? 
What keeps us going is the knowledge that Jesus went through far more for us. And he paid the ultimate price for us. It cost him his life. And he did it willingly because he was thinking of you. Friends, if you were the only person in all creation who needed rescue, Jesus would have come for you. It breaks my heart to think about some of these people out in the remote areas where rescue workers have not been able to get to them. If you were that person, stranded without food, without hope, this is who Jesus is. Jesus would come for you. And he did come for you. At the cost of his own life in order to give you life. When you realize that, You're able to stand on that platform of confidence and assuredness and you're able to serve and you're able to give because you always have Jesus. See, the reason we humans, we want to be first and we want to be best and we want the place of honor and we're always grasping after things is because we're insecure. We're afraid that if we don't have, we're not going to be okay. And the person who has received Jesus and really let that truth of who Jesus is sink in is a person who realizes that no matter what happens in life, you can lose your house, you can lose your car, you can live without electricity, you can even live without food, and you can die. And you're still okay because you have Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have everything you need. And then he calls us from that place of ultimate security to serve others. So you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Maybe you don't have much else. Maybe all you have is two pieces of bread at your house. But you've got Jesus plus two pieces of bread. Do you know what that means? You have a piece of bread to give away. In fact, you've got two pieces of bread to give away if you, if you need to, because you've still got Jesus. We don't need to cling to the things of this life. Because if we have Jesus, we have everything we need. Today, we are going to, for those of you who would like to participate, and there's no pressure on anyone, We are going to participate in the Lord's Supper. The bread and the grape juice that remind us of the ultimate sacrifice that he made. And this is going to flow in a very simple way as it's outlined in your bulletin with some songs, with the bread. We're going to have a testimony. We'll do some more singing and some scripture and the wine. as we appreciate and give thanks for what Jesus has done for us. Let's sing at the cross, number 163 in your hymnal, and the words should be on the screen as well. Out here who does not have the bread and the juice Simply just raise your hand and a deacon will get it to you.
The bread represents the body of Jesus. Go ahead and take that piece of bread out of the plastic wrapper and hold that in your hand. I'll read some scripture that speaks of the meaning, the significance of this this piece of bread. And then we will eat together. Matthew 26, verse 27 tells us that Jesus took some bread as they were eating, and he blessed it, and he broke it in pieces, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. This week, we have witnessed some incredible acts of kindness, many of us. This church has been a beehive of activity. Every day, teams have been going out from the church to serve, to cut trees, to carry food and water to people, to muck out homes. And we've had a team, well, and we've had many generous people donating supplies. The downstairs hallway of the church, lots of tables set up with food and water and baby supplies and all kinds of things that you can imagine might be needed in a time of crisis like this. And we've had some faithful people who have organized those tables and received donations and received people who have stopped by the church in need. One of those people is Susanna Cunningham, and I've invited her to come up and share a bit about her experience this week and the blessings of being involved in serving. Hello, everyone. I think I've been more blessed than the people that I've served, honestly. Uh, It's been such an incredible blessing to be able to help out the people that are in greater need than what we are, and um, I think what um, what really struck me the most were the people, and th- those were most of them, they were actually thinking more about others than themselves, and I literally had to, like, get out of them, like, what they really need, because they came there like, yeah, we need, you know, bread, water, but then I, when I started asking them questions, I was just amazed, because they actually needed more than that. There were... Um, Yesterday, there was a lady um, who came from Chimney Rock, and she basically, 
they lost everything. She said, um, the only way that we, we escaped this was because uh, the neighbor knocked on our door. Like if we had no idea, we were just in the house, we were trying to get protect from the storm. And we thought we were safe in the house. And until that neighbor started knocking and urging us to get out, we didn't realize how bad it was. And, and this lady then, you know, she had a lot of needs. She basically, they lost everything. I mean, there was like nothing that they could grab. They just left and, and all she was thinking were like other people. So I was like, no, you need, you need things. And she's like, no, I want to leave it for other people as well. Like we don't need them much. And you know, that, that just touched me so much because you know, when, when somebody just loses everything and then they can still think about other people around them, you know, that makes you realize that yeah, pe uh, it, it uh, restored my, my faith in humanity as well. And there, were, there was another girl that actually, <clears throat> so we were trying to help her with the you know, needs for her family. And then I started asking um, about the pets. The, and then it came out that she actually needed a lot of dog food and cat food. She saved like three stray dogs that were like running somewhere, maybe, you know, got lost in the storm. And so she ended up with like eight dogs and four cats. And um, yeah, and so she needed a lot of that. And, uh, and again, you know, she was thinking about other people, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is just so beautiful how you know, people that are suffering like more than we are, like they're still thinking about others. And uh, so I was very blessed by that. Amen. Around and to say, well, I haven't done as much as that other person to be of help this week. That's a lie of the devil. We are all doing our part. Some are capable of doing more and others not as much. And that is okay. All of us stand for this one. Jesus' blood. The pastor has so wonderfully explained to us exactly what that can mean to us and the power that it gives us.
We invite you to take the hymnal that may not be in front of you, but just don't take your neighbors. Uh, share it if you don't have one, please. I don't think there's a hymnal for everyone. But turn to number 843. That's not a page number. That's the number of the scripture that we will read together. 843. In praise of Christ, this is from Colossians chapter 1, and uh, Elvira will read the light print, and then I'll join you in reading the bold print. 843. Let's go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I invite you to take that cup of grape juice and remove the cover. And if your neighbor needs help removing the cover, help them. Hold that in your hand and listen to the words of scripture and then we will drink together. Continuing in Matthew 26. And Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Friends, that gift was given for you. The blood of Jesus poured out for you. Jason Whiteman's going to come share some of the things he's experienced this week. Thank you, Jason. So some of you have heard some of my stories. Oh, my guitar pick. That's funny. I leave a trail everywhere I go. That really was my pick. Um, some of you heard some of my stories last night. I'm going to tell a hybrid of those uh, now. Um, we've been working uh, in my neighborhood and, and then in the middle and later half of the week uh, down on Howard Gap in the Cypress Run neighborhood, uh, which was, is on the Clear Creek, uh, which was severely flooded. And at the end of the week, um, I had uh, just a really rough conversation with uh, Jimmy who, unfortunately, his house had been closed up all week, and I did not feel comfortable sending kids into the house. The mold was so bad, and every possession was in there. And he, I could tell he was desperate, and I gave him some resources, um, prayed with him, and he told me at the end, he's like, it's okay, it's not, it's not your problem. I said, well, I feel responsible in a way. Um, but he said, my house or my neighbor's what you guys have done has been so inspiring. And he said the thing that moved him so greatly is he's seen on the news, he's seen the pictures, he's, he's an older gentleman, so he's been around the block, he's seen these rescue efforts. And he said, but what I can't believe is the kids that you have out here working, and they're working so hard. He said, I haven't seen one on their phone 
And there was cell service there on Thursday. I, I promise, South Tower Gap had cell service with data. And they didn't, he said they didn't even sit down. As he, I said, what, what kind of kids are these? And I said, I, I don't know, sir. I, uh, a lot of them are in my Sabbath school class. And he's a Sabbath school, what is that? So I had to explain that. Um, but uh, the house we had just finished, um, the owner said the same thing to me. He said, these kids that you've got here just have inspired me so much. And Ken, um, I met him the day before when we, he got on our list. Uh, there's, we had quite a few people working in this neighborhood. Uh, there was a couple of southern teams. Uh, Heritage Academy was there. And then we had amassed a, a Fletcher uh, team as well. And the day before um, I met him, Caleb uh, introduced me to him. And he said, can you see what you can do at this guy's house? And Ken said, uh, it's been a rough week, uh, Jason. Uh, actually, uh, my wife was swept away in the river that was my street on, uh, on Friday morning. And he said she was rescued, but it was weird. We were going down our front steps trying to get out. The water came so fast, we had no idea what was happening. They made it halfway through the street and realized they weren't gonna make it, so they tried to back up, and his wife was swept away. She, she walks with a cane. And so Ken was able to kind of get back to high ground and watch his wife swept down the river, the street. And about halfway down the road, he saw somebody jump into the river, the street, and go in after his wife. And they both got toppled by what was a log or telephone pole, I don't know what, and went back into the water. At that point, it was armpit deep to a grown man. And just as they were about to go out of sight, he saw the man pull, drag his wife up the lawn from the houses on the other side of the street. And it wasn't later that day, the water started to recede and he was able to reconnect with his wife, which was, she was completely fine. Other neighbors took her in, got her cleaned up and she got home. And I asked Ken, I said, well, who, who was this guy who saved your wife? He says, we can't, we don't know. Not one neighbor, it's not a huge neighborhood. This is, I don't know if anybody knows how many homes are in Cypress Run, yell it out, I don't know, maybe 100, 50, 50 to 100, I don't know. Not that many. Not one neighbor is aware of anybody in the neighborhood that has told a story like that. They've gone house to house. No one knows of any strangers that were in the neighborhood that morning. I don't know why anyone would be driving through a flooded neighborhood at 6.30 in the morning on Friday after a hurricane. Um, so I, I told Ken, I said, that, I don't think you're going to find the person, Ken. And he goes, I don't think so either. It, it was an angel. It, it was. It was a miracle. So I watch, um, sometimes I, for whatever reason, this lady on Instagram keeps popping up on my Instagram. And she's a disgruntled Christian and has all the tired arguments about why Christianity might be a sham. You know, why do bad things happen to good people is a common one that you hear. Uh, and I think someone who's really paying attention to what's going on in the world, stories like this are happening every day. And what was so great for the kids to see is that in the darkest times is when the light that is the gospel is the brightest. And they witnessed that and they saw that their efforts, the light in their heart, was making a difference in the darkness and it lightened everyone, the whole street. I would go up and down this street, up and down this street, and by the, end of the, by the end of the week, everyone knew it was the Fletcher crew and other crews, and they, we've invited some of them here. I don't know if any made it or not, but um, it made a difference. It really did make a difference. So I've gotten phone numbers to all of them, and we'll follow up. So if there's, I think there's more that we can do there. So thank you so much to those that supported the efforts. Thank you so much for the kids that are out, out there. You know who you are. Uh, you really blew my mind. And have, have, I've recalibrated my opinion of the next generation. I know some of you may not have high expectations, but let me tell you, there are some kids out there that are going to lead this world when we're gone, and they will not let the slackers get in their way. Amen. Amen. Pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and grace towards all of us. 
Thank you for the privilege we have of receiving your love and then sharing it with others. May we continue to do that, Lord, as you provide the strength. Thank you for this church family, for the beauty that we have here, for the, for the joy that we have in each other's company. And I pray for those of us here, each one, as we struggle through this difficult time. Some of us were without power for a short time, and others are still without power right now. Some people have been able to take a warm shower, and others haven't. Help us to care for each other, and let nobody go from this place still in need today. May we all know that we have a father who cares and a church family that cares in tangible ways. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, saints of the living God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.